Mahava, and welcome to a brand new episode of The Doc Is In, where Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi's expert physicians and dedicated caregivers converge to explore the dynamic intersection of technology, compassionate care, and cutting edge research that helps deliver the best patient outcomes. My name is Prudence Marshall, and I will be your host for today's episode, brought to you by the Fatima Bin Mubarak Center here at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Before we dive in, remember to hit like, subscribe, and turn on the notifications button, as we're here to make The Doc Is In your number one destination for healthcare podcasts. So whether you're about to buckle up for a drive, getting ready for a run, or making a cup of coffee, join us now as The Doc Is In. Here with me on today's episode is Dr. Shafiq Sadani and Dr. Fayek El Jamali. Dr. Shafiq Sadani is an authored fellowship trained colorectal surgeon with our Fatima Bin Mubarak Center. He is the section head of colorectal surgery for the Digestive Diseases Institute and our director of robotic surgery here at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Dr. Shafiq completed his surgical training at Yale University George University and the University of Minnesota. Dr. Shafiq has over a decade of experience and is a specialist in minimally invasive surgical treatment of colorectal cancer with extensive experience in robotic surgery and sphincter sparing surgeries for colorectal cancer. Alongside Dr. Shafiq today is Dr. Fayek El Jamali. Dr. Fayek is a consultant surgical oncologist with our Fatima Bint Mubarak Center and a colorectal surgeon for our Digestive Diseases Institute. Dr. Fayek is a specialist in surgical oncology with a strong focus on the management of peritoneal surface malignancies as one of our providers for HIPEC. Dr. Fayek's credentials include 23 years of experience, concurrent fellowships in surgical oncology and advanced minimally invasive colorectal surgery, and he's also spent time as a tenured professor of surgery. Welcome, Dr. Shafiq and Dr. Fayek, to today's episode of The Doc Is In. Thank you, Ru. So the gentlemen are going to ask each other some great questions today on rectal cancer. I'm looking forward to your dialogue. So where do we start? Great, well, uh, thank you, Prue. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, and I'd like to welcome my uh, partner and good friend and an expert in rectal cancer, uh, Dr. Faig Jamali. Uh, today we're gonna discuss with our audience, I'm gonna kind of uh, uh, ask some uh, questions to Dr. Faig about the latest uh, in rectal cancer. Um, and we'll see what we can uh, in terms of give in terms of updates to our audience. So we're gonna dive right in. Uh, first of all, just give us kind of an overview on why, um, why rectal cancer treatment is so challenging and what's the difference between you know, diff managing rectal cancer and colon cancer and all the challenges involved. So thank you. It's wonderful to be here. I love this and I hope this is going to be beneficial to whoever is listening to us. So rectal cancer is actually quite challenging as compared to colon cancer for a number of reasons. The chief and most important reason probably is anatomy. The second reason is function. Um, and, and so I think let's dive a little bit into these and try to understand the specifics. Anatomy-wise, the, the rectum is located in the pelvis, which is like a limited box. We don't have a very wide margin when we're treating this cancer. Anteriorly, there are critical structures. Posteriorly, laterally, everywhere you go, there are critical structures. So we can't just go in terms of surgical resection as, as wide as we would like to go. And this invasion into nearby structures or the, the proximity to nearby structures makes it definitely more challenging. The second fact is that the pelvis is a kind of a curved area of the body. And so when you're operating, you you literally have to operate in multiple dimensions because at one point in time you're going down and then you're making the turn and going back up. So there's all these curves that you have to, to navigate in, in, in terms of, of the anatomy. So anatomy is, is, I think, one of the main issues. And then the anatomy is also linked to aberrant pelvic drainage, unusual pelvic drainage. Sometimes the lymph nodes are in the lateral compartment. Sometimes the lymph nodes even can go to inguinal compartments for really low rectal cancers. All of these are very specific issues to rectal cancer that you don't really have with colon cancer or with, with other diseases. The second challenging part, in my mind, is, is function. The rectum has an essential function in the human body. It allows us to store fecal material and allow us to evacuate at the socially appropriate time. And, and this function is important for our lives. Um, 
treatment for rectal cancer can um, significantly affect this function. And this has a long-lasting impact on, on patients. Um, and, and so that's why uh, this is also very different from surgery for colon cancer, because if you operate on someone for colon cancer, they're usually 100% back to normal. There's really very little difference that they're going to feel in their daily life. But when you operate on someone or you treat surgically someone with rectal cancer, there will be an impact. And that's something that we always talk about and consider um, in our um, you know, selection of which treatment we are going to follow and you know, all the intricacies that are associated with that. That's an important factor. Excellent. So um, what about in terms of, uh, you know, we know that compared to colon cancer, there's a lot more involvement in multimodality therapy in terms of uh, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, surgery, um, treatment before surgery, treatment after surgery. Lots of strategies have come up lately. Um, can you tell us a little bit about or tell our audience a little bit about, you know, what are the options now? What kind of strategies are we going for? Um, and what's changed lately in terms of the data and the science behind it? I think, um, honestly... A difficult question. No, lots really, of information I, Lots there, of information. But if you can kind of summarize. I will try. For so, so for the last 20 years, things have been very stagnant in the treatment of rectal cancer. Not much has changed. It was the standard. You give them chemo radiation, you operate, period. I think since the last... Three to four years, there have been a number of very significant scientific publications that have really changed or affected the field of rectal cancer surgery. The most important in my mind really is the immunotherapy role for the treatment of what we call MSI high or deficient MMR tumors, which is a very select subgroup of patients that represents maybe three, maximum 5% of all the patient populations with rectal cancer. But these patients now have a very effective immunotherapy treatment options that renders everything else that we talked about almost obsolete. They will just get that drug, achieve 100% cure rate, never need surgery, never need to lose their function, never need anything else. I think this is an advance that just came about in the last year or so. This is something that for the last 20 years didn't, we didn't even have in our armamentarium and it's very, very promising. So I think the first thing that we look at when we're dealing with a patient with rectal cancer is we look at their MMR status and MSI status. And if they're of the lucky subgroup of patients, the three to 5% that have this mutation, then these patients are candidates for immunotherapy upfront and usually that is based on the data that we have associated with 100% response rate. Then we talk about the other 95%, the vast majority of our patients. A lot of options have come about. Some up, uh, so what we have learned, to make a long story short, is that we want to give all of the treatment, whether it's chemotherapy or radiation or both, we want to give all of the treatment before surgery. Okay. In the past, we only used to give chemo radiation, do the operation, then give chemotherapy. A lot of patients didn't get to their chemotherapy because of complications. A lot of patients didn't tolerate the chemotherapy or didn't complete it, so they weren't getting the benefit. Many of the trials that have come about in the last three years have shown us that if we give all of this treatment before the surgery, two things happen. The patients do better, they have a better outcome. They have a higher rate of complete response, meaning that the tumor will go away completely. And we can have up to a 50% chance of what we call organ preservation, whereby we can avoid surgery altogether for these patients. So now we're doing, this is what has been called total neoadjuvant therapy. therapy. And this is what we've been doing for the last three years. And this has been also a very dramatic change in the multimodality therapy of rectal cancer. The most recent change that we've also come about is what we call the PROSPECT trial. It's something that we've been applying for upper rectal cancers, the ones that are 12 centimeters or higher, whereby we are trying to avoid or minimize radiotherapy. Okay. Radiotherapy is a very effective tool, and we have to use it when it's appropriate. But like any tool, it also can have side effects. And one of the side effects of radiotherapy is primarily low anterior resection syndrome, where patients have difficulty going to the bathroom afterwards, plus the long-term risk of a second malignancy after 10 years. So it's it's not innocuous when we use it. 
If there is a subgroup of patients where we can still achieve excellent cancer cure rates and excellent results, but minimize the use of this modality of therapy, then it would be reasonable to do so. And that's what the PROSPECT trial that was published this year has shown us, is that in a select group of patients where they have tumors that are relatively in the mid to upper rectum that don't have a threatened radial margin, where surgery with the help of modern technology can do a fantastic job at resecting the disease, those patients will do equally well if you give them chemotherapy followed by surgery versus the classic total neoadjuvant therapy treatment or any other treatment that we can give them. So there's a select subgroup of patients where we could potentially de-escalate, meaning give them a little bit less treatment and still end up with outstanding results. It's a positive improvement for patients if they're in that category as opposed to needing everything. Absolutely. I think the challenge now on us always, and as we discussed in every tumor board, is how do we individualize? That's the key. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to look at every patient. You have to look at their images, their the clinical condition, their wishes, their desires. Take all of that into account. Put together a treatment plan that's very specific for that patient that fits their goals and needs and from an oncology standpoint and from a survivor standpoint and from a functional standpoint. Take all of that into account and make the best possible decision. And I can assure our listeners the DDI Tumor Board is probably one of the most robust tumor boards that we have in the organization. So it's good to see everyone network together and consider research, the prospect trial, what's best. Medical oncology come into these tumor boards as well. Um, radiation oncology, we have PT. Pathology, um, as well. radiology. Pathology. We have specialized radiologists. So it's nice to know, and this is something that our, our listeners, for referrals and, and having patients at Cleveland Clinic, it's nice to know that we have that available to us. Um, so I, I know where that robust conversation so comes one, one from. So one of our quality metrics is to make sure that every patient that we're operating on has actually been discussed in an at MDT. This is really important, I yeah. think. we. This is for the interest of our patients. This is what we do. Yeah, holistic care, patient-centered. It's definitely great. That's great, wonderful summary for uh, multimodality care. Um, we didn't dive into the meat of the surgery part, which is what we want to talk about today mostly. Um, but before we dive into surgery, so we talked about individualizing multimodality care um, and, um, and all the options for multimodality treatment leading into surgery. But what about patients who are trying to avoid surgery, uh, the so-called watch and wait approach or organ preservation where patients are able to get treatment and keep the rectum and try to avoid the morbidity uh, of surgery and the quality of life um, downstream effects of surgery for rectal cancer. Tell us a little bit about you know the latest in organ preservation, who's a candidate for that, um, and who follows these patients, and how do we know that they continue to um, be cancer-free um, without actually taking out the rectum and looking under the microscope and seeing that there, uh, there are no cancer cells there? Well, very amazing, very amazing to topic. So let's try to explain that. So over the last, th this started about maybe 10 years ago, there was a very famous medical oncologist called Angelita Habergama in, in Brazil, who had followed a number of patients who had rectal cancer but never had surgery. And those patients had achieved a very good response to the total knee adjuvant therapy, and she showed that 90% of those patients had achieved a complete response, meaning that they did okay without surgery. That was the first paper. And obviously that was met with a lot of skepticism. And it really took time and a number of other studies and a number of other trials until now we've come to the point where this has pretty much almost been accepted as a standard of care. And that is something that we actually sometimes aim for from the beginning as we start and we discuss the patient, we aim for trying to achieve organ preservation. And what the OPRA trial which is, you know, the trial that has looked at the role of total neoadjuvant therapy in terms of organ preservation has shown us is that you could probably achieve organ preservation in up to 50% of patients with modern therapy. That means 50% of patients who normally would have had surgery and lost their rectum with all of the impact that that would have that now are able to um, avoid the surgery. So who is a candidate for organ preservation? Essentially, all patients with rectal cancer, we consider them for potentially for organ preservation, if at all possible. We will design a treatment plan that aims at achieving the best possible response. If they are, usually the response rate to achieve this is in the range of 28 to 30%. So about a third. If they are in this one third category where they respond completely 
to the neoadjuvant therapy, chemotherapy, radiation combination of this treatment. And we have demonstrated evidence of complete response, and we, now we're gonna talk a little bit about how do we demonstrate that. Uh, then those patients could be, if they desire, and they understand the risks and benefits, and that's also the second point that I need to discuss, could be candidates for organ preservation. So the two points that we need to discuss is how do we assess that they've had a complete response, and then how um, do, what are the risks and benefits of choosing this approach versus surgery? So to assess, we do really primarily two essential tests, an endoscopy, flexible sigmoidoscopy, to look at the site of the lesion and make sure that the mucosa has healed, that there isn't an ongoing ulcer or residual disease. And we do an MRI with something we call diffusion weighted images to see whether the lesions, because endoscopically you can only see the mucosa, the MRI will show you the lymph nodes around and will show you the thickness of the wall and will show you if there's diffusion restriction, meaning that there's possibly some cancer cells that are remaining behind in the wall of the rectum. If you have a negative MRI and if you have a negative endoscopy and you desire organ preservation, then I think you'd be a perfect candidate for that. If the patient chooses organ preservation, it's not a forget it. It is a very active surveillance protocol where every three months we see them on a regular basis and we do a repeat endoscopy, repeat MRI at least for two years because the highest incidence of this cancer coming back is going to be in the first two years. If there's any residual small cancer cell that didn't disappear completely, that could result in regrowth and recurrent of the cancer. And we have evidence that if they choose watch and wait, and they, were, they get a recurrence, we can salvage that. We can salvage that with another operation, and they do, they do well. They don't do as well, and that's probably because the biology of the disease is different. So patients who develop a local recurrence have a higher rate of metastasis and a higher rate of failure. But we don't think that that's because of the local recurrence. We think that that's tied to the biology of the disease, which is more aggressive. That's why they recurred locally but it's still, in my mind, is a very valid option for the treatment of patients. Now, for patients, what do they need to know? Well, they need to know, first of all, that they have to do intensive surveillance. Second of all, that they have about a one in four chance, 25%, one in four, that despite evidence that the tumor is gone, one in four patients will have a recurrence in the first two years after this. If they cross the two years mark, the chances of local regrowth goes down significantly meaning that 75% of patients who choose organ preservation are able to achieve it. Yeah, so about half of the patients are candidates. Yeah. Not all will choose organ preservation. Some may choose surgery because they want peace of mind and they don't want the follow-up or they don't have the ability to do the follow-up. Yeah. They, you know, they, they, they have to travel or they, there are a lot of personal considerations. Uh, but if they choose that, then, then they, they have to do the regular follow-up. Uh, but th there's a 75% chance of that being successful. And the main advantage of that is that they maintain their function, they maintain their organs, so they avoid the morbidity of any possible surgery, but also the surgery itself is not the big deal, it's the impact on quality of life. And so their ability to, now there will be some side effects from radiotherapy, there's a small incidence of, of low anterior resection syndrome in the subgroup of patients, even without surgery, but it's way less than with surgery. So in terms of functional uh, outcomes, it's certainly um, very favorable um, for organ preservation. So what would you tell, you know, uh, some members of the audience or some physicians would be skeptical about this, um, not offering surgery to someone who's had a complete clinical response? Um, they may feel it's not standard of care, uh, you can't be sure. What would you tell our listeners about that? So, I, Is it I, as safe? as someone, for someone who had a complete clinical response, in your hands, someone who's able to detect a complete clinical response with reasonably good accuracy, would you say it's as, as safe uh, oncologically as offering surgery to that patient? Wow, that's a difficult question to answer. <laughs> well, <laughs> but it is what we struggle with. So. The opinion that I'm going to give is very personal now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because if you, we, do we have very solid randomized trial scientific evidence that those two approaches are equally safe? The answer is no. We do not have that evidence. The evidence that we have comes from small patient series that have been followed over a period of time with good outcomes. 
Uh, we have the OPER trial, which is a randomized clinical trial that showed that there is actually a, an, a rate of organ preservation of about 50%. We know from everything that we know, which is collected data, that the, the risk of failure is one in four, but none of this is, is really solid trial randomized evidence. So for someone who wants peace of mind, surgery remains the gold standard. There is no question about that. That's the Be official. careful, because I can ask you it in a different way. <laughs> God forbid you had rectal cancer. I'm coming, what would you want? But I'm not going to ask it. That. But, that, but that's, <laughs> that's, exactly, gonna... <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to say. So let me, let me now that I've, none of them have given you the official answer, which is the, you know, the, the, the book answer, the board yeah. answer, whatever it is you want to call it, I will give you my, my personal Assuming answer. Assuming whoever's taking care of you has the expertise to de ad, you know, accurately detect a complete clinical response and do the appropriate surveillance. And salvage me. And salvage <laughs> you. you. Because the salvage anyway. operation but is But the tougher. decision before that. Right. But, but assuming that that expertise was available, I would be aiming for a complete response with treatment and I would be aiming to avoid surgery personally. And I, I know that I recently had a friend of mine who had rectal cancer and we, we immediately aimed at organ preservation, achieved a complete pathologic response. He's done well so far. He's almost a year out now from his treatment. He's very happy that he didn't undergo surgery. And, and I would absolutely have chosen personally made that choice if I was in issues. So great for him. And I think I would say the same. <laughs> I think every healthcare professional has that list of expertise if anything <laughs> happens to them. So I think that was built into the question. Yeah. I actually have a, an add on question. I think for our listeners that are perhaps outside the expertise that you have, if you were a general practitioner or perhaps a, a gastroenterologist moving into the field, do you have any advice for that surveillance period? Do you have anything where if they've, a patient's moved or they've undertaken a patient as a general practitioner or they've undertaken a patient, any advice for monitoring that surveillance period, any advice for when they would escalate someone that was in that watch and wait? Because I know that that was something that's come up um, on our previous campaigns. Jeffy, you want to take this on? Uh, well, I would say there's a program and okay. it's, uh, it's, you know, there are guidelines for that. Um, firstly, uh, the, you know, the ability, there has to be the expertise to be able to identify what constitutes a, clinic, a complete clinical response. And that, as Dr. Faik said, is, constitutes one, you know, three things. One is uh, a complete endoscopic response, which means when you scope the patient, uh, every three to four months, especially the first two years, uh, you should be able to detect certain changes and the absence of certain changes um, that tell you with a reasonable accuracy that this is a complete response. Clinically, is in terms anything? of endoscopic. Yeah. Um, then the second thing is, you know, an exam with the finger, a digital rectal exam, if it's low enough. And the third thing is the MRI. Um, and so, if you have those three things pointing to the, to a complete clinical response or even a near complete clinical response, sometimes you can wait. But if you have those um, and the patient fits those criteria, then I think it's reasonable to, to offer the patient um, the watch and wait strategy, organ preservation in terms of quality of life uh, and function, uh, functional outcomes. Um, so there are, there, there are guidelines for how to do surveillance for these patients. Yeah. And whoever's doing the surveillance should be an expert in those, in those, uh, in those guidelines and how to, how to detect those um, and how to follow the patient and to streamline the care for those patients in terms of logistics and coming to clinic and having it done quickly and expeditiously and regularly. Yeah, it is um, a regular follow-up, yeah. so yeah. It's a commitment from both the physician and the and patient. The patient. But I think for, you know, to have a better life for the patient, even though we like to do surgery and this is one of the surgeries we like to do, but in terms of, uh, you know, we see how these patients uh, live in terms of function. Like he said, it doesn't never goes back to perfect. So um, if you can avoid it, it'd be great. And we've had some success with multimodality therapy that's put us out of business. <laughs> it's nice to see though, holistic medicine uh, yeah. coming through with both your answers there. So we talked about uh, all the other stuff before surgery and trying to avoid surgery and all that fuck. So what about patients who 
come to the point where they need rectal cancer surgery. And let's talk about the mid and distal rectal cancers, the ones that are more challenging. So um, let's talk about the, you know, some details of surgery. We'll talk about lateral pelvic node dissection and, the, um, and how important those are lately. But let's talk about sphincter preservation. So that's kind of uh, a reason we see a lot of patients here in terms of a referral center. Uh, patients, obviously most patients don't want a bag. The first question they ask when they see you is, am I going to have a bag uh, if I'm going to have surgery? And so what patients are we able to avoid? Let's talk about permanent colostomies rather than temporary diverting lupuleostomies. Right. So permanent colostomies, which patients need that and which patients don't? Uh, and let's push the limits of our, um, of our operative ability in terms of preserving sphincters. Tell us what we can do nowadays. Great. So and when I was a resident, about half, maybe 40% of the patients that we were operating off of rectal cancer were getting a permanent colostomy. That's a pretty high number. I think surgical technique has evolved dramatically over the last 20 or 30 years. The most important advance in my mind has been the introduction of robotics. And I think we're going to have a whole session on robotics later. So I'm not going to... But, you know, some people are still skeptical about the robot, but the robot in the pelvis has been unquestionably an amazing advance. There have been other technical advances, use of Tata, Tata approach or Tata ME approach, which is an approach that is from below up. And so the things that we can do now, we had a lot of difficulty getting into the low pelvis because of that curve and because of the anatomy. The new tools that are available to us, either the approach from below or the use of the robot has greatly facilitated this approach. It has given us the dexterity, the precision, and all the things that are needed. And so now we can go and, and do a much better dissection. So one of the first hallmarks of a good quality surgery for rectal cancer is go, doing a complete total mesorectal excision and making sure that this envelope is intact. That's really essential. And it's required in the CAP reporting by the pathologist. It's requiring in the North American uh, rectal cancer program. You have to have photo documentation of your specimen to make sure that you've done a good job. And, and I think this is, as far as surgical treatment, this is one of the most important things. The second most important thing, let's talk a little bit about sphincter preservation. The most important thing for us is that the tumor is not directly invading into the sphincter, one. Two, that the sphincter function is good because some patients have a weak sphincter to begin with and that's, that makes things challenging. So they have to have a good sphincter function. And three, the patient is motivated and desires sphincter preservation. So if you have a patient that desires it that has a good sphincter and the tumor is not really involving the external sphincter, we have a clear margin. Most importantly is oncologic safety. But if we can get a clear margin, then we can do all, all kinds of intersphincteric resections, a full intersphincteric resection, a partial intersphincteric resection, which means removing parts of the internal sphincter. So the internal sphincter is on the inside, the external is on the outside. All of that can be removed. As long as we keep the external sphincter, patients will have good function in terms of continence, and the majority will be happy, will be happier with this than with a permanent colostomy. So we can really push the limit. And I would say that today our rate of APR, extremely selective, extremely selective. I mean, that's the minority of patients that get a, a permanent colostomy. The, for the vast majority, we, we, we do everything we can to try to do sphincter preservation. So historically, a low distal rectal cancer invading the internal sphincter, those patients would be relegated to an APR. 100%. Permanent colostomy. 100%. So now what you're saying, is if a distal rectal cancer is involving the internal sphincter but not involving the intersphincteric space or the external sphincter elevators, there are technical expertise to allow us to resect from above, resect from below, and put that patient back together. 100%. Okay. Absolutely. That's great. That's well, well, uh, well summarized. <laughs> um, A lot so, of public lymph nodes. So before that, yeah. you touched on the concept of uh, total mesorectal excision, TME, um, and we know the importance of that from historical data about uh, local recurrence and even survival. Tell us about the importance of the technical expertise in terms of doing a good operation in terms of, you know, in rectal cancer. You know, in colon cancer, 
we know in terms of quality of surgery, we want 12 lymph nodes or more, um, a good lymphadenectomy, decent margins, distal and proximal. That's pretty much it. What about you know, rectal cancer and the TME and the importance of technique, surgical technique um, in rectal cancer? Tell us briefly a little bit about that. Um. I think uh, surgery for rectal cancer is the Everest of our specialty, honestly. I think it is so critical for patient survival and it's somewhat difficult and challenging because it's in the pelvis, it's in the narrow space, it has a, a lot of curves that, that I can't overstate the importance of having expertise. I mean, if you look at, um, for every almost every surgery, there's a volume to outcome relationship. There, it's been demonstrated in esophageal cancer, gastric cancer, pancreatic cancer, hepatobiliary cancer, rectal cancer is definitely one of those. In order for someone, for, for someone to achieve proficiency in rectal cancer surgery, they need to have at least, they need to be in a hot volume center, they need to have at least 50 to 100 resections under their belt. And even then, it continues to be a challenge at some, in, in, in some patients. And so, and that, in my mind, is the most important element of survival. I mean, yeah, we talk about the MDT and multimodality therapy, but in the end, if you don't do a good job in doing the surgical resection, then everything else you've done goes down the drain. So this is a really critical critical factor that, that I think requires training. So someone has to be really trained, board certified, experience, you know, and, and demonstrated experience through large number of cases, through outcome tracking, outcome measures, you know, and, and, and those are the things that are really important. And I really, I mean, my message, if I want to send the message out there is, I mean, rectal cancer is not that common. The number of cases is not that many. Uh, I would really um, encourage colleagues to look at these patients as unique patients and, and refer them to centers of excellence, refer them to center of specialty. It's not going to take a lot away from them. I mean, we're, we're told we may be talking about one or two patients per year for that. But it, for the patient, it'll make a big difference. So bottom line, in rectal cancer, the quality of the surgery is directly proportional to the oncologic outcomes. 100%. Um, great. So uh, lastly, tell us about uh, this kind of recently uh, popular concept of lateral pelvic node dissection and the importance of lateral pelvic nodes um, in mid and distal rectal cancer. Perfect. So, so um, this is also something that, because of the rectal anatomy is, is a little bit unique, um, the Japanese are always leading in something like this. They, they have uh, amazing knowledge of the lymph nodes and their distribution, and, and they're very careful and meticulous at following their patients. And so we, we have been noticing that there is a so, small subgroup of patients that not only have lymph nodes spread within the mesorectum, but also in the what we call lateral pelvic lymph nodes, which could be the internal iliac, obturator, any of those lymph nodes that are sort of lateral, not within the mesorectal envelope. Typically, these are not involved in our routine surgery. When we do a total mesorectal excision, we take the mesorectum and all the lymph nodes within it, but we don't typically usually tackle these. Uh, there is a number of very interesting um, studies recently from all over the world, started in Japan, but then more, more so in the United States and, and a number of other publications that show that patients with lateral rectal cancer, lateral lymph node metastasis from rectal cancer have a higher rate of local recurrence. And that's because you take out the cancer itself, but you leave behind those lymph nodes and these lymph nodes grow and then cause a, a local recurrence. So there's an increasing appreciation and understanding for the role of these lymph nodes. And now we know that they're routinely included, whether the patient gets chemo or radiation, they're included, routinely included in the treatment plan. And then we look at them after and we see what their response. And in some cases they go away and that's beautiful but in some cases they remain. And then when you're going into the surgery, does it doesn't make a lot of sense to remove the cancer but leave these nodes behind? The answer is no, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense. If the patient's gonna go for a surgical treatment, then they should be addressed at the same time. So the technique to do this is somewhat challenging. It, 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 uh, it's done deep in the pelvis over the lateral aspect. There's a lot of treacherous vessels in that area. It requires certain expertise and training. It is something that we've trained for and, and the robotic technique helps a lot. And it's something that we offer here as a, a um, I think, unique 
um, a service to some of our patients with lateral pelvic lymph nodes. And so now we treat with multimodality therapy, we look at the response, if there's a dual disease, then, then we need to take those out and we target the movement. Move so, Fak, for our audience, just to clarify, are these lateral pelvic nodes, the ones that we see along the internal iliac obturator nodes, are these considered regional nodes or are they considered metastatic nodes? How should we be looking at them? Yeah, um, absolutely regional. Mm -hmm. Absolutely regional because the data that we have that these patients, when they are treated surgically and have the lateral lymph nodes, they have as good a prognosis as if they didn't have them, meaning they, they act like a, a local regional rectal cancer patient, not like a metastatic rectal cancer Definitely. patient in terms of survival and overall outcome. So it does make a difference on local control because they don't get a local recurrence and on survival if they are appropriately Excellent. treated. So, Bru, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, I've got time. All right, <laughs> really quick. Okay. I think it's important. This kind of lateral node uh, dissection uh, brought up another concept in my mind. I think it's important for our audience. So what about metastatic rectal cancer? I'm not talking about widespread metastatic rectal cancer all over the place, but what about um, synchronous metastatic rectal cancer to the liver um, or isolated to the lungs? But let's focus on synchronous liver metastases with rectal cancer. Historically, you know, we've kind of looked at these patients more as a palliative approach, um, very historically. Now with advances in you know, our multimodality care, our advances in uh, safe surgery, better surgery, better technique, and better anesthesia, uh, what would you say about patients with rectal cancer and isolated, synchronous, potentially curable liver mets? How should we approach those patients in terms of strategy? Um, and what should we expect for those patients in terms of you know, future life? So uh, if there's no question that having metastasis puts you in a stage four category and your chances of cure dramatically drop. But when I say dramatically drop, there's still at least 40% chance of cure. Even in this subgroup of patients, we can achieve cure in almost 40% of those patients if you look at the statistics. And, and so I think definitely Treatment with curative intent is the way to go. We want to treat those patients with curative intent. It factors in, we go all the way back to the beginning, we go back to the multimodality decision for treatment. It factors into our choice of chemotherapy. It factors into our choice and timing of radiation therapy. We have to factor in now the liver lesions and how we're gonna treat them and the timing of when we're gonna do this. In some patients, when there's a significant amount of liver disease, we may choose to do a liver, what we call a liver first approach, which is we give chemo, we attack the liver, make sure the liver is clean, then we give chemo radiation, and then we attack the pelvis. That could be one approach that we choose for some of our patients. And then for others, it could be a combination of you know doing it at the same time, or th there's a whole lot of different variations that you know is too, we we can't cover all of that. But the message is. Clear, I think in my mind, uh, we aim for cure whenever we can. And we try to go for cure whenever we can. And the presence of liver metastasis, lung metastasis, small amount of peritoneal metastasis will not, I think, uh, affect uh, our, our decision. Uh, we, we have to arrange a little bit the treatment protocol to fit the, the situation. But I still think that we can achieve a cure in a good percentage of those patients, as high as 40%. And so even though they're stage four, not all stage fours are equal, and a lot of stage fours are potentially curable, and that's what we aim for. Great. So I guess that's a topic, a whole, whole other topic for another uh, podcast. Maybe we can involve like, our HPB and transplant surgeons. I think we just found another topic and, with Dr. Yeah, Quintini. Yeah, great. And I think that brings in the benefit again of, of tumor board, of having yeah. those individualized treatment Precisely. programs when you, when you get patients like that. So a very passionate and expert discussion today, gentlemen. Thank you thank so you, much. Um, thank you, Dr. Um To our thank listeners. Thank you for watching, guys. I hope that you have enjoyed this podcast. I know I did. I learned so much again today. If you would, uh, you're a provider listening or if you'd like to make a referral to Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi to either Dr. Fayek El Jabali or Dr. Shafiq Sadani, please www.clevelandclinicabudabi.ae and you can refer a patient to us. The gentlemen have their find a doctor pages on the website as well and I think we're definitely back for a talk on robotics so make sure that you go to the next podcast after this one. Thank you again for joining the Dockers in and it was a pleasure having you.